first detective and later spy and assassin, Nick Carter has been continually evolving since his debut in a New York Weekly in 1886. In the 19-teens, Carter headlined his own magazine and many of these stories had a spooky supernatural quality with Carter at times playing a bit of the occult detective. Nick Carter's two-gun pulp incarnations beginning in 1933 show a wilder, heroic, more real-world engaged international Nick Carter, like a weird twin of Doc Savage, who pulp publisher Street and Smith also brought out in 1933. But by the 1960s, in the wake of the phenomenally successful James Bond, Carter had morphed from detective to world spy and assassin, trying always to out-violence and out-sex his British twin, forever traveling from one site of mayhem to another one constant from inception in the 1880s to the present is that Nick Carter is most at home when there is trouble in paradise. Whether in the 1880s, 1930s, or 1960s and 70s, Nick Carter was always both a mirror and a medicine to the anxieties and political discord of the day. 19 teens anxiety about the rising wave of anarchism send in Nick Carter. In the 60s and 70s, he was quick to jump into every geopolitical hotspot and he would do it early enough that the books have an interesting time capsule feel. Che Guevara, a thorn in the conservative establishment? Well, he's dead, but well, send in Nick Carter to kill him again. Castro, the demi-devil of communism right next door and the doomsday weapon in Cuban hands threatens to explode World War III, send Carter in. Saigon was not only a city, but a whole volatile mindset during the Cold and Vietnam War. The French influence was still everywhere, and while one cover speaks of destination Vietnam, flashpoint of world conflict, the other speaks of Saigon as a place where political and personal intrigue overlap, calling it Little Paris, where love talk is wiretapped and each can lead to sudden mayhem. And then there's the Chinese paymaster. And Checkmate in Rio, a new novel from the intimate world of espionage at work and at play. And how about Thunder Strike in Syria? And the Cat Man Do Contract. And the Beirut Incident. And Berlin, that living emblem of a split world in which a beautiful woman is Nick Carter's only lead in the hunt for a new Hitler ready to seize power again. The first man knew too much, so they shattered his body into a thousand pieces before he could give a shred of information. And the second man in Berlin lived in terror. Death had pursued him through a lifetime devoted to espionage. When they pumped a bullet through his throat, he was not even surprised. But the third man was a lot tougher to knock off. His name was Nick Carter, and he was ordered to pursue the assignment that had killed the other two. This time around, Nick had to destroy the fanatic leader of Germany's neo-Nazi underground, a man wearing a known and trusted face and hell-bent on becoming the next Fuhrer. For Nick, the assignment begins with a blonde doing a strip tease in a bedroom of an ancient castle on the Rhine. And then there are the wildly fanciful ones, which nevertheless sometimes seem oddly prescient. 
The Red Raids, an exciting new Killmaster espionage adventure, Nick Carter, in which a bizarre new sex ray is being used by the Red Chinese to launch a global death game. Their first targets America and its ace operative, Nick Carter. It was impossible, but it was happening. Somewhere in the world, a powerful transmitter was blanking out all TV programs and substituting a savory blend of Chikam propaganda and pornography. Nick Carter's orders were to find the transmitter and destroy it along with anything else that got in his way. The trouble was he hadn't counted on running into anything like a Hollywood love goddess out for extra special sex kicks or a beautiful blonde revolutionary out for blood. And by the time he discovered the odds were stacked against him and he had about a million in one chance of staying alive. Many of the 1970s and 1980s versions of Nick Carter read a little like fast, amped up and rather garish rewrites of Ian Fleming's James Bond series. Bond's Rosa Klebb from Russia with Love is a character for the ages. In Nick Carter, the Golden Serpent, Rosa's recast in extreme forms, the sadistic Gerda von Roth, who at one point is staring down at her naked and bound spread eagle lover, Nick Carter, after whipping him almost to death and ponders whether to kill him with more whipping or give him the option of making satisfactory love to her and then disposing of him. Within a few minutes, the bloodied but ever resourceful and ever virulent Carter is doing what he does best as if his life depends on it, and it does. He loosens a cyanide pill from under a cap in his molar, figuring it is only at the moment of Gerda's climax that she will suck in air with sufficient force to draw the already melting cyanide pill from his mouth to hers. Now that is some plotting. And I quote, Nick managed to tongue the cap off his molar. He moved the cap to one side of his mouth, not daring to use a finger to get it out. He could feel the little cyanide pellet in his mouth now, smooth and innocent, seemingly as a piece of tasteless gelatin candy, but it was deadly and it was already beginning to melt. The drunken laughter echoed wildly around the vast bedchamber. The Countess sank her teeth into Nick's, Nick's ear. Come on, big lover man, she jeered. Work for your supper. And so he does. And so she dies. So Nick Carter definitely qualifies for Garbogist, but I like garbage writing from Shakespeare's Titus and Jonicus to Henry Miller's more risque stuff. Carter is a fast and easy read and so extreme it's never boring. But it's the paperback covers that redeem the books a bit, since they're often so over the top, they enhance the text to create little time capsule nuggets of interesting, mild depravity and extreme sexism that gives us a glimpse of a gone world. So here are some of my favorite Carter covers along with the original art when it's available. Have a great Garbagist and thank you for watching.